This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, former New York Federal Reserve Board Chair Sarah Horowitz talks about her book, Mutualism, Building the Next Economy from the Ground Up. She's interviewed by American Compass Executive Director Oren Cass. I am thrilled to be joined here by Sarah Horowitz, uh, who is uh, one of my favorite writers and thinkers on questions of labor and the future of work. And... Uh, especially of note, not only uh, great at writing and thinking, but but also the rare practitioner who has made a real difference in the real world uh, in, in a whole bunch of different fields. And, and I'm looking forward to talking with her about some of that as well. Uh, her new book is, is Mutualism, Building the New Economy from the Ground Up. Uh, and welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you, Arm, for having me. I guess I guess we have to start with the the cliched question in in a in a discussion like this, which is what is mutualism? Uh, and and you have the the sort of three dimensions of it, and and I think it would probably be really helpful to to start by going through those and and just having you talk a little bit about why each one is important, and then maybe just an example of kind of what what does it look like when it's working, and and on the other hand, what what does it look like when it's not, or or what would you say doesn't count? Uh, and and so the first one is that, that mutualist organizations have a social purpose um, and, and to solve a social problem. So how how do you define that? What what counts as a social purpose and a social problem? Yeah. So the first thing is that when people are thinking about mutualism, they should realize it's everywhere around them. This is not an abstract thought. You see it in your everyday when you go to the grocery store, the things you buy, the people you know. So when we think about these different uh, elements, just to think about your own life. So the first is it's a social purpose, but within a community so that it's bracketed by a community that has uh, an interest like workers who are unionizing or people who need babysitters or a mutual aid group to help people get food in the middle of the pandemic. So instead of it being something where we look at this as a social problem, a foundation might come in and analyze it and decide that it's worthy of a grant and then provide that grant. This is a community coming together and saying, we're going to come together to solve our own problems. So that's the first element. And so does, does community activity in, in general fall under this bucket? Is, is starting a little league or, you know, Picking up, picking up trash in the park, does it go that broadly or does it really have to be more of a uh, sort of uh, I, sort of something of social value that, that we would kind of measure in, in those terms? You know, it's funny. I'm going to just go into what the second element is. Sure. I think that's how we can really get at your question. So the second element is what I call has an economic mechanism. And that might sound like a formal thing, but it really just means that people are paying for it themselves. Sometimes it's dues, sometimes it's subscriptions, sometimes it's tithing. And so what it really is, is the pairing of those two. It's a community of people who come together because they're solving a problem together and they are funding it themselves. And so that is how the two match up. What would that look like? Well, you could just think of the American labor movement as unions. There are dues and you have steel workers, you have alphabet Google workers, you know, unions range across the country from skill level, but it's that idea of dues and workers coming together. Same with food cooperatives and issues of food security and uh, the, the mutual aid groups that grew up in COVID. So people then are coming together and there's a transaction. And that those two go together. And then the third point is that it has to have a longer term focus and a way to transmit those ideas longer than just a short term thing. So it's kind of the opposite of a social media campaign. So typically you have a board of directors or some way that you're passing that information on. And so what I think is so helpful is that mutualism, when you can analyze it yourself with those one, two and three elements, you can start to look at it, your world and say, what are the things I could do in my local community? Or how can I evaluate a strategy of others to know if it's mutualistic or not? Mm -hmm. And why do we care? Why is, <laughs> why, why is mutualism good or, or 
uh, you know, either whether you want to say it's just different than or, or better for some things or, or better in general than the other ways that, that we tend to solve problems, whether that's just expecting that the market will do it or, or looking to public policy in some yeah. way? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And really, the answer to that is that we're human beings and through our history, through the centuries, we've been engaging in mutualist behavior. Uh, Benjamin Franklin started the first mutual in America, a fire, a fire insurance company. And so the why, why do it? It's because we have to start to build the institutions that undergird our democracy. And interestingly enough, they always start with a mutualist strategy because that's really how democracy works. People come together, they have a concern, and they have a means to communicate what that concern is. And so on a basic level as a human being, you'll find that these are the institutions that have your, your um, interests at heart. They really are devoted to their membership and they're not there to make a quick profit. They're there to solve that social problem. But because they have their own money, they can be there from generation to generation. Now, if you fast forward to 2021, where we're in a crisis of trust, understandably, we just see our media, we see our elected officials, and we don't feel like they're connected to us. And one of the things that a mutualist organization does is it makes you realize you're not alone. When you're connected to other people, you have an ability to go to your elected officials, not as an isolated individual, but as a group that has some power. And then you can affect the market Again, not as an isolated individual, but as a group. And that is what is transformational. And what I am convinced of, not just from writing the book, but what got me to write the book, was that we have to see that we have collective agency, just as throughout our history in America, that's how we built the New Deal, the civil rights movement. So it starts on many levels, but it always starts with those three elements. Yeah, and it, it does seem like the the labor movement is sort of a, a quintessential illustration here. You you pointed to it a couple of times, and and it's fascinating the way you you open the book with it, talking about the the ILGWU, if I got the acronym right, um, which which was striking to me in part because of how even that conception of of labor has changed over time. I mean, I think what we take for granted in America today, unions are all about, is I guess you could put it under the, the mutualist label still, but it, it feels like it strains, at least in places, whereas you, what you were describing from, from a century ago was, was obviously squarely in the mutualist tradition, but also just sounded very different than, than, than the world as it is today. And so um, I'm, I'm curious if, if, if you could both just sort of tell viewers a little bit about that story and then underscore what you think has changed and, and what's changed just because the world has changed versus what, what should we try to get back to in, in yeah. a sense? Yeah. So um, we just say the ILG in my family and uh, I uh, grew up, my grandfather was a vice president of the ladies garment workers union. And when I look at the, what that union did, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s. So for people who may not know, it was the garment workers who, were the sweatshop workers of their day, the true low wage workers. They organized together and they formed uh, this union in addition to the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union. But what they did was they said, representing workers vis-a-vis -vis the employer is of course critical, but we're gonna take those dues and we're gonna then build our own banks and insurance company and housing and summer camp. And that really was the full uh, the full expression of, of being a human being. So you could join with other people to really be shielded from the harshness of capitalism. And that way people made sure that their children were, were able to get formally educated, to uh, know uh, and live in a world of art and culture. And so it was really this expression of, of, of the full range of, of what you can do. I often think of that period of the 1920s in particular as like the lost, the lost um, Atlantis, you know, so that we forgot that unions could do all those things. Now, let me just be clear. So many unions still do that. The hotel workers do this. 
Um, so many do, it would be hard to say, but what we've gone to is this idea just that the unions are there to engage in collective bargaining and under a mutualist framework, in which I think we're going to move to, is where government and President Biden will, I think, have to do this, start to have these mutualists deliver the safety net. What do I mean? I mean, like, as we're trying to figure out how to get people vaccines, you should be able to go to your local union, your food cooperative, your credit union, and start to be able to have them help you navigate these difficult issues. So unions could be engaged in training, retirement planning, instead of just locating everything at the employer where we have a more tenuous relationship, let's go to these organizations. I would say in addition to labor, the faith community is also incredibly important and the best example. And again, let's go through it. People are tied together through their um, spiritual, contemplative or faith base. They have a means to pay for it through tithing or dues. And they have a board that continues it from generation to generation. And I think that when you think about faith groups and unions, mutual aid groups and cooperatives, they're in the perfect position to deliver the safety net, which is how we make mutualism go to scale. How do we deal though with, with, with the safety net in particular with the problem that a lot of the folks who are the, the potential recipients seem almost not to qualify under under your definition, that is that that they're the ones who 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 can't pay in potentially, and and so it seems like we have a disconnect between uh, the the sort of mutual aid society that that you're describing in in the past versus a world today where it is expected that those who can afford to pay taxes and those who cannot afford to receive benefits, and uh, you know I think we'd probably agree on on a lot of the benefits of the or the advantages of, of the former more mutualist model, but is it inherently exclusionary? How do you make sure that a community that's paying for itself therefore also chooses to pay for those who can't afford to pay? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is that it's really, this is not a libertarian argument that people will just do this by themselves. It's really calling for an activist government that enables this to happen. And so as you then can look out at different strategies that people articulate, like guaranteed minimum income, well, instead of just delivering it to isolated individuals, which is troubling, what you can do is deliver it through these important organizations. And then what you'll do is you'll see this reemergence and of, of intermediary or institutions that undergird democracy. So to me, when I look at like the historically black colleges and universities, I think that the government should be buttressing their endowments and they should be uh, really more actively engaged to deliver a safety net. They should be front, the front lines of this. So I think that the really important thing is to, number one, realize that when you start thinking mutualistically, you start by what people have and everybody has something. People have time, they have knowledge, they have their relationships within their communities. And so I really don't believe that mutualism is exclusionary. I think the issue is how we then take the organizations that people are connected to. And I think sometimes that's one of the deficits in our culture right now is we're critiquers. We love to say what's wrong, you know, and we love to go on social media and immediately say what's wrong. And I think we have to move to a culture of builders. So when you have a critique, great, what's your solution? And I think that we're all feeling a lot of exhaustion over this last year. And I think that we have to get back to some ideas of, of love, connection and being builders. And I think that is what mutualism is about. And it's funny, you, I think you, you started the list of what people have with time. And, and that was actually about to, to be what I was gonna ask is, is do people have time? You know, it, it seems like one of the constraints, even even pre-COVID, is that my perception anyway is that both both the economy and the culture have shifted to a uh, more of a mode where people essentially work as much as they can, and that's kind of all. That's and then they're and then they're exhausted. Whereas in the past, if if you had fewer two earner households, if you had um, larger extended families and communities, you had more 
effort being invested outside the labor market. And so I think, you know, aspirationally, what you're describing um, sounds like a, a better place to be, but is there, do you either see any green shoots or else what do you think it would take to, per, you know, per, persuade the, the, the folks not to be on as many business trips or not to have the, the, the two 60 hour a week jobs? How, how do you create that capacity to do more than just critique? Well, number one, I think that we have to realize that it's not because people are choosing to work two 60 hour a week jobs, but we're in a massive speed up. We have the worst distribution of income. We are hollowing out the working class and the middle class. And those are political issues. You know, I think one thing that's really important as we talk about this, you know, both the Democratic and the Republican Party are controlled by one tenth of one percent of the population in so many ways. So it's very hard for them to articulate that they're for the workers when really what we have to be looking at is redistribution. And what is so obvious to me is that in mutualism, you are building the institutions that ultimately have the power to say, this is not how we need to order our society. I think the faith community is going to play a very important role in discussions about the economy because a lot of these are very moral issues. And when we go back to what we were talking about, the ILG in the 1920s, that was a very political moment where the union built up power, power in politics and in the market, and took that market power and shielded workers so that they could have time to be the full human beings that they needed to be. And when I was founding and organized the Freelancers Union, we called that Freelance 360, the realization that freelancers have to be able to put their lives together as human beings with time, and that that's a political issue because you have to reorder how we're um, shaping the economy. So I do think we're experiencing this time problem because of Ronald Reagan and others that really uh, eviscerated the union movement so that it really couldn't be the check um, on that corporate power. I guess I'll push, I'll push back on that a little bit. I was thinking that least- <laughs> on at least in in the context in which in which I had been thinking with the question is that when I think about the the household with the two people working sixty hour a week jobs, it doesn't actually tend to be the working or middle class household. It's actually more likely to be the household with the two postgraduate degrees, um, and and especially if you look at you know with with families with children, if you look at how folks choose to arrange their lives. Uh, we were actually just doing some some survey work on this, which is why it's top of mind for me. Working in middle class households are actually much more likely to say they prefer and then, in fact, have, you know, e- either one parent working part time or, or one parent out of the labor force entirely. Whereas it is the, those with the highest levels of education and income who are we could debate our use of the word choice in this context. But in a sense, at least from a constraint perspective, choosing to most fully commit their their time and resources to their professional lives. And, and so while I think it, it is certainly a mistake to take the view that, you know, it, it is the high income and, and high education folks who have to lead everything, it, it does seem to me that there's a sort of basic institutional capacity if we want to, to, to build these kinds of organizations, actually solve problems where a lot of the people who might historically have been leading that work are instead so professionally overcommitted right now that that they're not engaged in their communities. And you can tell me that's just an unfair characterization, but but if it is, I then that still strikes me as a problem, maybe just a, a cultural one that that we have to cope with. Well, I, I would I would say this. It is to me the whole of the working class. And very low wage workers also are working very many shifts just to get by. And I think that that raises this really important issue that is, I think, as important as this culture of shifting from critique to building is when you look at the working class, we have decided in America in 2021 that that is only low wage workers. We have split off the professional workforce and we said they are privileged or they don't really have a right to complain. Um, And really, when you look at this, and I'm sure you're just going to disagree, or at least we'll have something interesting to chat about, the first 
anti-union labor law was Taft-Hartley in the 1940s. And the first thing it did is it split off the professional supervisors and the most skilled workers. Labor, you could argue, has been losing ever since. And the strongest labor movement is when you actually join people together. And I would suggest that I'll agree with you that I think we're too consumerist and you know there's a lot that we could talk about there. But the truth is that there's an economic struggle as people are doing worse and worse unless they're in the very top, top of the income earning bracket. And so what I think is important is we realize we're actually having a work problem from low wage work all the way up and also a security problem. And so that transcends. And I think both are right. Um, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought this up. This is the, the line in, in the book that I underlined four times to, to make sure we talked about is, is when you wrote, you said the emerging neoliberal view couldn't have been more different than the one that you were raised with, which saw the working class as a whole, uh, regardless of whether they were low wage or professional workers. And I have to admit that that puzzled me a great deal, um, thinking, uh, sort of partially in terms of, of how we conceive of solidarity, but also just what people's economic interests are today. Uh, it's certainly the case that, that, the, that, 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 that the Google engineer and, and the you know, nursing home aid are both workers um, and they're both under various strains and pressures, but I am hard pressed to, to think of them as, as under at all the comparable strains or pressures, or as, as the same kinds of policies being likely to benefit both of them. And so is, when you think about that, and, and you might have a different sort of quintessential example you'd prefer to use, but is, is your thought that, that they are essentially both on, on the same side of of, of these divides that we're faced with or that, that they both essentially have the same needs that aren't being met? Yeah, let, me, let me just say this and be so clear. That is the problem in America today. We have decided that there's a worthy working class and another group that, yeah, they work and earn a living and worry about retirement and don't have health care, but they're somehow some other kind of worker. That is both the left and the right, and we've internalized Ronald Reagan's worldview. So when you hear progressives saying that they're really just focused on one group, you have to say, oh, so then you agree with Ronald Reagan's worldview. We are all workers. Anybody who earns a living, that is, they're not rentiers, they are not earning their money because they have so much wealth that they live off that interest, which is teeny. And once we see that we are all workers, and we unite that group together, that is the winning political strategy. But because we keep dividing them, nobody seems to be able to get a really ruling majority to articulate what the next safety net is, and then to tackle the biggest problems in addition, like climate change, racial equity. And so I think that is one of the biggest problems today is that we have separated out the working class and therefore, we don't articulate real solutions. We articulate many solutions. But what, so what's an example of a solution that, that both the, a problem that both the Google engineer and the, the home health aid have that requires the same kind of solution? Anxiety about retirement, anxiety about health care, worrying about their children, worrying about climate, worrying about what's going to happen, like people in Texas, seeing this strange weather patterns and feeling that they're worried that their grandchildren won't do as well or have the same earth that they have, that we, but I think it's something deeper. I, I actually think, and I, I really do feel like we're in a place where we have to get to healing. It's kind of very not likable. It's, it's not nice to say that some people have problems that you care about and other people have problems that you don't care about. It's, there really is this incredible similarity and you kind of have to ask yourself if, if we can design a system that can work universally, those are always the ones that work. To me, the best government program ever is social security and that covers everybody. You know, of course it does. 
when you look at the UK or Canada, they have a healthcare system that covers everybody. Of course it does. So why are we so quick to divide up what should be divided? So healthcare is actually an interesting example, I guess, when I think about, you know, recent fights about healthcare reform and, and even proposals for single payer. One of the groups that that doesn't especially like that, of course, is organized labor because they already have what they consider to be very good healthcare plans in place. Um, and so, whereas again, I, I think you could say in, in an ideal world, everybody would want the same thing. It does seem like in practice, people are quite rational to want different things or, or am I being too crass about it? No, I, you know what I actually think? I think there's a way for us to, to evolve the way we talk about healthcare, which is we need, to realize that the employer is not gonna be the major place that people get health insurance for so many reasons. Job tenure is lower, the churn rates, so many low wage workers are just not going to be earning enough money that their employer is necessarily gonna be providing full healthcare. And so when we talk about single payer, we just assume that means government will deliver it all. But I think that that too is a sort of Ronald Reagan orientation where an individual goes to a website and buys an individual plan. And instead, we should go back to the mutualists and get it so that we say, you can get your health insurance from your credit union, from your union, from your church, mosque, synagogue, from your meditation center, from your mutual aid group. And that once we insert the ability of these groups to come in, they will do a few things. Number one, they will start actually improving health care because they're connected to people. If you look at the coal miners' health insurance plans, they are very rich in taking care of black lung disease. When I did freelancers unions health insurance, we made sure to focus on mental health anxiety and carpal tunnel. So they will start to be able to have specialization, but then they'll start to really be uh, the constituency that fights to improve and keep those plans over time. And so what it does is it really creates a much more local economy where people are connected in a much more local way, and then they're connected to their government. So again, it's building a layer. And you know, intuitively, it's true that if you could go and get your safety net from the people that you trust and know, you will feel a lot better. And I think that that's really important. I call that biodiverse scale. So there's big box scale, there's big government. Washington has a big program and it implements it. And then there's biodiverse scale, which is you go across the country to these kinds of mutualist organizations and let them build mutualism locally or from the ground up. Do you, do you have a problem then where the, uh, the the people who are most in need are also in the places with the least infrastructure? I mean, I, I think what you said, I, I would certainly agree with respect to myself that I would feel very comfortable about having a safety net, you know, in, in my own community. Um, but then if I think about the the sorts of places where we think of, of the safety net as, as playing the most vital role, whether it's in uh, you know, deindustrialized areas of the country that, that as you've described, have, have really been hollowed out and seen, you know, a lot of people move away and so forth. Or, or if you think about sort of, you know, uh, well, both both in, in rural areas and inner city, if you think about places with significant family breakdown and so forth, it, it seems that there's, there's a misalignment between where we have the institutional capacity to provide a safety net through that la layer you're describing, but then also as opposed to where the, the need is for it. So do, do we have a way to get the capacity to, to where the need is greatest? Well, let me just say, when you start to look at what people do in their own communities, they're not powerless people who have nothing, you know? And I think we have to get over that. I think that's like a very um, top-down worldview. When you look at any community, there are churches and religious type organizations. There are ways that people are helping one another out. Um, and we have to realize that that's how you actually start to build 
infrastructure. And, you know, I think one of the great examples is looking at the African-American community, the Black church in particular, with AME Zion Church starting when people who were uh, told that they couldn't sit up front, they had to go to the back of the church. Um, that's where they belonged. And they said, no, thanks, we'll build our own church. And if you actually follow that through the Underground Railroad, the civil rights marches, all the way now to the community development financial institutions, they all can trace that line from the first mutualists at the beginning of our country. So what we really have to do is enable people to start building those kinds of organizations and have government enable them. Let's start having funding for that. Let's start having patient capital so that instead of just funding things you know, willy nilly, we're actually making it so that the organizations that people locally create actually get the money. And the more that they do, the more they can build and that we set up the rules to enable them to do that. When you look at procurement in terms of disaster relief, what we do is we set it up so that the usual players just get all that money. Why don't we create pipelines so that people have an opinion about what to rebuild? And when it's your community, you're going to be making decisions that are built to last. You're not just going to make a short-term decision. So I really do think that mutualism literally is a different mindset, but it's in many ways, going back to what we were like in our early part of our history when we really had that ability to organize. And it's really the last 50 years that's the aberration where we just think that managers and professionals will go into foundations and government, they will figure it all out for us and then they will implement it. And I think it's not just that they do or don't do a good job, it's that that process doesn't work and it doesn't keep democracy vibrant. And I think we're living that in 2021. Yeah. And so do you see the the transition to mutualism as, as something that seems like it's underway or is it something that, that we need to find a way to jumpstart? Yeah, I think it's both. I mean, I think you could look at COVID and what happened with mutual aid groups that just grew in every uh, every city, every state, every rural area, that people just immediately started seeing that their neighbors didn't have access to their pharmaceuticals or that they didn't have food or couldn't go out and that people really found their way to do that. I would say, interestingly enough, also technology is starting to create what I call group infrastructure, which is that instead of creating something where people just, again, as isolated individuals, go online to talk or buy something, they actually are starting to come together. The biggest, of course, are Google groups, Facebook groups, I don't think really are mutualistic at all, but a good starting place. Um, but you can see that uh, Substack, uh, all sorts of ways for people to come together, mobilize, mighty network. So Silicon Valley is realizing that people are already starting to come together. And you know that with their algorithms, they're not making that up. And so, that I think we're already going to see where we can, we will. But when we need to start to plan about delivering the safety net and training and healthcare and retirement, that's when the government has to play a role to not just jumpstart it, but to bring it to scale. And by the way, you know, Teddy Roosevelt did that with the cooperatives in the reddest states because he saw that the blue states, not that they talked about it like that, were the ones that were industrializing. And FDR did that. He didn't say we're going to have a new deal and there are going to be these things called government unions. He said, no, the unions follow. He didn't say the three elements of mutualism, but they did, which were they had their own dues. They already had a community of interest and could pass this from generation to generation. And he then made the new deal delivered through the union movement. So we already have those examples. That's when government is at its best, is when it's building up the mutualists. And it's kind of a little rule of thumb. Is an elected official building up the mutualists or destroying the mutualists? And that is going to be the, the question for this next era. So what are what are a couple of constructive policies you'd like to see pursued? If, if you were legislating, uh, what, what, what does it look like for a, a politician to be building up the mutualists? Yeah, so number one, I think, is to understand that these are important organizations and to take an audit in their district of where are they and who are they. 
This, and so that you can engage in a conversation about what you need. I think the biggest issue for President Biden is to start to think about the next initiatives for the ACA to be delivered through these kinds of organizations and to set them up so they can. And I think that it's an answer to the conservative idea of association health plans, which to me relax too many insurance regulations and don't have this kind of community orientation. But if we can start to enable unions and cooperatives and faith groups and mutual aid groups to start with these pilots in a bunch of different places and then to expand them, we would show that not only will they do a good job, which they will because they're local and there's competition for them. So if they do a bad job, they die, but people will start to have other kinds of benefits of feeling more connected when they see these kinds of organizations in their areas. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it, it's, you know, when I think about conservative uh, sort of perspectives on these kinds of issues, it's there are some areas of, of, of tremendous overlap. I think, you know, conservatives talk a lot about the idea of mediating institutions and, and concern about the health of social, of, of civil society. The, an interesting, I don't know the extent to which it, it's a point of conflict, but, but an interesting issue that conservatives tend to focus on is when it comes to government, the idea of crowd out and the concern that to the extent that you have government doing things, even things that are trying to be very helpful, one of the effects is to actually sap all of the energy and demand for the kind of, of mutualist activity that you're describing. Now, obviously that depends somewhat on, on what form the government support takes, um, but I'm, I'm curious to what extent do you see that as as a relevant concern that that when government stands up and says, you know, anything from here here are various safety net programs to, uh, you know, now there's a lot of discussion of of some sort of child allowance. Just here's here's money coming straight to every family. Um, that even though that that meets immediate problems, it actually is is an obstacle to the kind of of mutualist energy you're talking about. Yeah. So let's just start with the. I don't think there's any crowd out when government gives a mutualist a job to deliver a safety net and gets paid for that so that it has revenue and that it can take that revenue like the ILG did and put it into education and other things. And it's not the government's opinion about what happened, it's their money. I think that that's not crowd out at all. Where I do see crowd out, and it kind of, it came up actually during the last campaign with the hotel workers and their great healthcare center. And you had so many liberals saying, just get over it. You know, the government will just have a universal and then your fantastic healthcare center that's really focused and rooted in the community should just go away. And I think that happens so much and happens in the last 50 years. And that's because we don't have a connection between the workers uh, and their representatives articulating to government, but instead we have like policy people who like went to Brown and Swarthmore and feel like they're very intelligent and they really know what's best for people. But it, that's to me where the crowd out really happens. And um, it, it's, it's enabling these groups to, to stay entrepreneurial, but not entrepreneurial in a libertarian way, entrepreneurial in a way that is about having competition, having a commitment to excellence and being rooted in community. Yeah, so if, if you take a safety net program um, or, or kind of if you take it, the safety net as a whole, the way we operate it today is, 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 it, is it is almost all federal money. Uh, sometimes the states have to match or, or maintain effort in various ways. Uh, and, and the federal government essentially sort of sets out a list of uh, restrictions and rules and conditions and state government agencies then implement those through programs that deliver the money to individuals. And so it's, it's almost like it's got every level except the one you're talking about. You've got the you've got the federal government, then you've got the state government, and then you just sort of jump over to into the individual household. Um, and and I take it that's something you're saying, and, and something that that I would certainly agree with is that it would be what you'd really actually want to do is say, look, we we need the government gathering and channeling these resources, but who we ideally channel them to are mutualist organizations. And whether those are unions or faith-based groups and so forth, um, 
those are then the ones with relatively fewer government rules who should decide how to deploy the resources. Is that is that a is that a fair description? Yeah, I think they have to work in tandem. It's a it there's there's no way that you don't have an active government. But what is really critical is that you you know it's it's almost like design theory. You really want to have the right people around the table. And when you don't have the mutualists around the table, they have local knowledge. They have knowledge that has intersected with local experts. And that's what you want to co-design with that community. I often think that the metaphor is when you get on a plane with a kid, a parent and a kid, and the instruction says, in the event that there's a loss of oxygen, when the, the thing comes down, put it on yourself first and then take care of your kid. That's what we've been doing is we've not been putting it on the grown up and we're just putting it on the kid and that's just not a sustainable way to make policy. And I think the reason why we continue to do that is because the cultural frame really stemmed from that separation of the working class. And so that we stop seeing like we're actually all in this together. We're gonna design a series of initiatives through these organizations that are gonna tell us what their communities need. And then we're going to rechannel the money that's already there. The other thing about mutualists that I think is so important as COVID ends, and it will, we are going to have a lot of things we have to do. And people can't just wait for government. They have to be able to have an ability to start right away. And that's what mutualism does, is it lets you start something because you collect the funds from your local community. Then what we'll see is those local communities will start to have very similar issues, concerns, opportunities, that's when they'll say to government what they need. And that's how we'll know that we're really going to be successful because if government then says, we got it, thanks, goodbye, bad. But if we actually take this crisis as the opportunity to then build this next safety net, we will co-design it with the mutualists. And that's how we will, like Roosevelt, see this is the new deal. And that's what I think we have to plan for is the next 50 years. And the mutualists have to be the ones that co-design it. So I, I want to play a little bit of a lightning round with, with application of, of mutualism to, to various challenges we have. Um, and, and so, you know, one you mentioned in, in a couple of different contexts is climate change. What, what, what does the, mutualism, the, the mutualist say we are getting right versus wrong about climate change? And, and what would you want to to to, to see folks doing? Well, I think the most important thing is realizing that mutualism starts locally and can often start small, but it is the mutualists together that have political power and market power. And when you look at climate change, there is no reason that we are burning fossil fuels the way we're burning them, the way we're designing our cities and urban centers that don't have public transportation. And so one of the major things about mutualism is that you're really embedding organized citizens hyper-locally to start to have power about how we're organizing our cities. And yes, against a lot of the special interests that just keep making us make really bad decisions about the environment. And it really is the threading of that economic, but with the political. And I think that's a perfect example of how you would actually see change because you have elected officials who would be, uh, have to be responsive. How about education reform? Is, is mutualism a case for sort of school choice and charter schools as the, as the model? No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I think that you need to be able again to enable communities to be active in their schools. And I think the more embedded in communities that a school is, the more successful that it would be. Uh, but I do think that we can be creative about looking at ways that we can let the communities play a different kind of role. But again, I think it also has to do with funding and other things. But a, a great example of mutualism that's not necessarily government is that we could be really enabling people in the community to be active in the school. 
So one thing that we hear about a lot, for instance, is that we're creating a jobless economy, that people won't have any work to do, which I don't think is true at all. We have a lot of bridges to build. We have a lot of infrastructure to build. We have a lot of kids that need educating. So why wouldn't you start to enable the community to come in with time and to then get paid to be helpful in the support that people need? But it's not up to me to legislate or to even say that. What it is, is for us to have a culture that lets local people feel like they can make a contribution and can really be activated in that. It's just a nicer way to be rather than just wait. And when the government decides, then we'll all get started. And how about with labor? Do you, do you see the, the, the challenges being get more people into unions or, or strengthen the hand of unions to organize or different kinds of unions? What would you want to see uh, on that front? So let me just say, I mean, I think when you look at labor history, you can see that unions always evolve and change. There were craft unions in the 1800s, industrial unions in the last century, and we're gonna have new forms of unions, uh, especially a lot of independent contractors that are starting to organize like alphabet workers or coworker.org, the rideshare drivers. And that when you start to see that evolution, what is really important is to give labor a pathway to see how all workers can be organized. And that's a great example of co-designing with mutualists. Understandably, President Biden is going to talk to the AFL-CIO about what it needs to succeed. And I think that once we start to say, this is going to be, people need to be able to organize in their own way, in their own communities. They need to have unions that enable them to organize in the way they actually work. And the traditional labor movement needs to have a job of delivering the next safety net, not just giving that up to either the employer or the government. The, the union movement should be doing it. And you look at a lot of unions, they already do so many different things in addition to collective bargaining, from training and upgrading programs, retiree assistance. I mean, these are mutualist factories. So we just have to expand what they do. And that that's how we come together. And it's not all Pollyanna, you know, not everybody's going to love everything. But once people see that they're, they're, somebody wants them to survive and thrive, they're much more open, but when you're under siege, the future doesn't look bright when you're fighting for your survival. Yeah, it does seem like the the, the future of work plays a real kind of role in this. I mean, de depending on what you think the future of work is or or should be, there's then kind of a lot that 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 comes along with it. And I guess what it what it is seems at least hard to know, but I'm very curious in terms of what it should be, to what extent do you think the sort of, the, the, the transition to a, a much more kind of precarious or, or frequently shifting um, model is either inevitable or uh, obviously not precariousness, but, but flexibility could be a, a good thing in a, in a mutualist framework versus to what extent do you see the more traditional employment relationships as, as something that has to kind of be a core part of, of, of a successful formula. Yeah, I mean, I think that what's really clear is that if people have to have a sense of security in their portability, that they are going to be having many more different projects and jobs and other kinds of work. And if we don't build that in, there will be precarity. Uh, but I, I do feel like we, we have to look at the challenges ahead and see what we're gonna need and then build in how people will do that work. So I do reject the idea that we're just not gonna have work. We don't even need work. I don't believe that. People need work and love. Work helps orient people in their lives and provides important structure and connection. And so what we have to get our, our minds around is that we may very well be building up infrastructure creating ways for people to take care of one another, use crazy technology like the distributed ledger of Bitcoin that will enable people to have time banks and other kinds of alternative currencies that let them trade time. Those are the creative and interesting things that I think we're going to need, but it all has to have a basic safety net that is very tangible, providing healthcare and training and retirement and 
those things. You can't even get to the other things until you get that basic security squared away. That, that's, that certainly makes sense. We, we just have a few minutes uh, left. And so I wanted to, to make sure we, we sort of wrap up on, on, on the practical side of things for, for, for the reader or, or the individual out, out in his or her community. Um, you know, I, I think the idea of mutualism has a, has a ton of appeal and, but, but then there's the, okay, what can I actually go do? Um, obviously you have to identify a problem that needs solving, but what do you see as kind of things people should most be thinking about, or, or maybe most importantly, things people get wrong and, and need to think about differently? Yeah, you know, what I tried to do in the book is to lay out the future of government, the future of capital, and also the future of you. And so I think one of the first things is to realize that you can start to be a mutualist yourself. You can meet your neighbors and form a block association. You can go to the supermarket and look at cabbage cheese and King Arthur flour and start to realize REI that there are all sorts of cooperatives around you. You can find out about credit unions. So the point is start off by thinking mutualistically, thinking about what am I in with other people that I care about? Do I want to form a knitting circle? Are there a group of people or an environmental issue that's local? But the most important thing after you've identified that is to then say, how are we going to pay for it? Let's form an organization. Let's go on Venmo or something and just start to have some kind of dues. Let's plan a meal together. Let's eat together. And these are the things that begin to build mutualism. What doesn't build things is to just have a campaign or to say, oh, and it's all free for everybody. Because when it's free for everybody, then you just haven't put a stake in the ground. And that's another cultural shift. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great. You, When you think about the organizations you belong to, whether it's your religious or contemplative community uh, or your credit union, you open your wallet because you want to use that but you want the next generation to as well. So start those. Those are the most important things. Yeah, the, the eating a meal together is, is really interesting. And I know you've talked about that in, in the freelancers union context as well, that some of, some of what makes this work isn't just uh, the, the, the campaign, even, even the well-funded and, and long-term one. It's the, it's, it's the human interaction. And that's one of the things that mutualism offers that, that some of these other models we're, we're stuck with right now seem to, to really leave out. And when you listen to people who especially lived in apartment buildings during COVID, people would say, I never knew my neighbors before. And that to me is just the, the shame of this society right now. It's very alienating, it's very distrusting, filled with anxiety. And actually when you sit and you break bread and you eat and you learn the names of people's kids and what's important to them, you start to feel rooted and connected. It really does have psychological ramifications. When people look at blue zones, which are these funny areas where people tend to live to over a hundred, why are people living there? One of them made that to that age, why? Because they're in a community where people are connected and regularly are getting together. And that's really what mutualism is saying is in every nook and cranny of America, people can come together, they can have a meal, they can find what their means are for something that matters to them. And that's the building blocks of democracy. Has been, always, will be in the future. It's an incredibly important message. Well, I think we have to leave it there. Sarah Horowitz, thank you so much. The, the book is called Mutualism, Building the Next Economy from the ground up. Uh, and for, for all the fascinating insights you, you've shared here, there are many times more in, in the book. So I hope, I hope readers will check it out. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org.